Dr. Heidi Schultz is a geneticist and she is currently in a fellow postdoctoral fellowship at the Human Genomics Institute at the University of Regensburg in Germany. She originally comes from Argentina. She did her undergraduate uh, work there in nutrition and toxicology. Very interesting combination. Um, and she has been uh, working in Germany first on her doctoral uh, degree and now as a postdoctoral fellow. And she's going to share with us uh, the role of genomics and health. And I'm looking forward to her presentation. She's also the mother of two small children and uh, balances many activities, including uh, being children's ministry director in her local church. So Heidi, we welcome you this morning and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, if we can start the, the presentation, or you are reading your booklet, you see the title can be a bit puzzling. Hel in the light of all the news that we're getting about DNA this and DNA that, and new genes identified, I'm going to talk about health beyond your genes. Isn't that strange? I mean, you could wonder, Dr. Schultz has spent four years looking and finding mutations that lead to vision loss and blindness, and sh now she's going to relegate genes to a second place? Hmm, strange. But let's pause a second and analyze the data to see if cracking the genetic code was actually sufficient to help us understand why we human beings are so complex. Was that all, or was there something else to find out? Remember the time when you were a small, skinny, tiny cell? No, you don't. You were just a cell with 46 chromosomes. And that one cell would give rise to more than 250 different cell types and would divide to generate 100 billion, that's a one followed by 14 zeros, of cells that make up your body today. And that one cell encoded in a two meter long DNA strand were the complete instructions for your life. Or could it be that there was or there is more than just this DNA strand? Let's find out. Let's have a look. The genome was cracked or decoded, and we know we're made up of 46 chromosomes, that we have about 20,000 genes, and the DNA strand is made up of 3,000 million letters or base pairs. So, does that explain the complexity of us human beings? Let's see. If we look at the number of letters in the genome of mice, we see that there is 2,000 million. We humans have three. About amoebas, you know, amoebas are really tiny. You can't even see them with your eye. They have a genome that's 200 times bigger than our genome. Hmm. So what's the clue? Maybe the chromosomes. We have 46 chromosomes, nice, but your dog has 78. And they fern in the tropical forest more than 1,000. So it's not the size of the genome, it's not the number of chromosomes. Okay, I know, it's the number of genes, right? Let's see. Your chicken, or a chicken, has 17,000. We have 20,000, but the potato that you, maybe you ate this morning at breakfast, has 39,000 genes. So it's not the genes. So what is it? Strange, isn't it? Maybe a clue could come from looking at the percentage of letters that actually encode for a recipe. You see, that our genome has these 20,000 recipes, genes. So if we look at that, and here on the graph, you can see that other organisms, their whole 
complete sequence letter has one recipe right after the other one. So everything is encoding for something. But we humans, only 1.5% of our genome actually encodes or has recipes that we can read. So for 30 years, scientists talked about junk DNA. The 98% of the genome that didn't encode for anything was just garbage, left over from the proposed evolutionary uh, origins of man. But maybe the clue to our complexity lies in this junk DNA. Actually, the term junk DNA was banned from science again in the year 2007 when it came to light this DNA is not so garbage as we have thought. So, I'll share with you why, why, in spite of the fact that I am fully aware that specific mutations do cause diseases, I became interested in what's called epigenetics, on what's on top of the genes. During my PhD about 10 years ago, someone asked me about this 98% of the genome and what I thought about it. And I said, you know, I think we in science still haven't figured it out. It's not garbage. Let's wait and see. And actually, after a couple of years, we're starting to have the evidence. Fast forward to the year 2006, 2007, I was teaching at River Plate Adventist University, and the students had a devotional at the beginning of my class each day. And I thought, okay, maybe it would be nice if I would also get involved in the devotional, and I just had about five minutes to prepare the devotional, and I started thinking, ah, what Bible story has something to do with genetics to integrate? And before I tell you what story I thought about, I'll ask you, how many of you have heard about, and it's not bad if you haven't heard about it, about the agouti mouse? Who has heard about the agouti mouse? Okay, I see about 3% of the audience. It doesn't matter, in 10 minutes you know what the agouti mouse is. Anyways, I thought about which Bible story has genetics in it. And I thought about the story of Jacob and his miraculously growing flock of goats with a particular pattern in their coat. How could that be? God had said, you know, put these sticks in the water when they come to drink. How can you explain that miracle? Huh. Wait and see, maybe I'm not saying that's the explanation, but it could be, you could find a hint during my talk. So, and finally, the third thing that got me thinking about epigenetics is the fact that my daughter has celiac disease, and it hasn't been found till yet that a gene that causes celiac disease. So there's a predisposition, but there must be other things influencing celiac disease. And so, I thought, started thinking out of the box, and uh, I'm really excited about epigenetics, and I hope that you will too, because uh, this conference is about lifestyle and preventive medicine, and I hope that in this talk, you can get a glimpse of the mechanisms that work so that preventive medicine works. So, what is epigenetics? The definition the study of reversible heritable changes in gene function that occur without a change in the sequence of nuclear DNA. I'll explain it easier, yeah? So, let's see. Every one of you has a computer, I guess. When you go to the store and buy the computer, you get a nice box, but if you don't pay extra to get some kind of operating system and software, that computer won't help you much, yeah? Okay, the computer, is your genome, your DNA. You got the instructions, but you need to regulate the functioning of these instructions to decide which recipes are we going to cook today, which are we going to cook tomorrow, so that it will work and it will turn out well. And the same thing is with software, so you have to buy a software to get it functioning. The hardware is the genome. Epigenetics is the software. Is it clear? Until now? Okay. So, let's go on. You've also heard about the nature-nurture debate. What is more important? What you inherited or what you lived and so on. So, twin studies have shed a lot of light on this issue, especially identical twins. They get the same genes, 
They grew up in the same house, and nevertheless, we see that for some diseases, there is a big discordance between one twin developing, for example, schizophrenia, and the other one doesn't, or diabetes, and even cancer, even breast cancer. One twin gets breast cancer, the other one doesn't. So what, what's going on? And investigations are going on in this, and it's revealing what's the role of epigenetics. What's, the, what's behind our gene and genome? It's not so static as we think. It's more malleable than we ever dreamed of in science. And that's what makes it possible for one cell to give rise to different cell types. Each cell will have a different barcode, will be making different recipes, will be cooking different genes, if I, you can understand the analogy. And this is what is so wonderful. You might be wondering, when and how does this all take place? The answer is that much of it takes place during our embryonic development. Um, and what are the mechanisms? Well, here we have a DNA strand or a model of it. And you know that this DNA strand is made up of four different letters, A, C, G, and T. And the Cs can be marked a methyl group can be added onto this, meth uh, onto, uh, this cytosine, and that marks it. And if in a region of the genome you have a lot of marks, then that means for the cell, we can't read this. This is turned off. So you can, by marking, labeling the cytosines, you can turn on and off, on and off. That's one mechanism, methylation. The second one, before I show that slide, is the fact that we have this fine strand of DNA that is really long and it has to fit into this small, tiny nucleus. And it's so fine, it would uh, I'll break up and get tangled up if you didn't compact it somehow. So God made something called histones, like little balloons, yeah? And the DNA just wraps around this histone, so I'm the histone now. <laughs> and the histones have arms. And these arms can be either open or closed. If they get some marks on them, they're called acetylation, they open. If, and if some enzyme takes away those marks, they close. And they bind tightly this DNA, and it can't move, and it can't be read. It's like when we get our genome from our parents, we get a book. A brand new book, you might think, but it wasn't a brand new book. Actually, we got a book from our parents that in some places had highlighting. Really important, read this, read it over and over again. And then we had some instructions, for some reason, had been put and said, don't read this section. You don't need this section. I mean, it's not our parents who decided, but their lifestyle decided what we could read and what might be turned off. So some things happened before we were born, and this is what you can see here. Right after conception, a lot of things take place. In the first eight days, everything, many signals that came from your parents are erased, but not all of them. And then in the next coming days, new signals are put. That's why it's so important, this period of time in development. And not only that, also signals for this next generation, for the second generation, also from your grandchildren, are being put at this time. And when you are born, the enzymes and everything that can put in these marks and take them away functions really good. Yeah? But as we age, it starts getting a little bit worse, you know, this whole regulation. And that's one of the mechanisms why aging takes place, because it, things don't work as they should or as they work at the beginning. So a very critical period is during pregnancy. But there has been, a, not experiments, but analysis of data that have shown that information can get passed on from one generation to the next.
So it's what you do doesn't only influence your life, the life of your children, it influences your grandchildren's life, for example. There is one region in Sweden called Ovakalix, and this region is quite isolated, or was isolated in the 19th and 20th, beginning of the 20th century. And so, and there were good records about how many people were born in what year, how much crops they had on the following years, and so on. And so someone had the idea of taking 300 men and looking at their parents and grandparents and seeing how much food was available when the grandparents were growing up, when the parents were growing up, and does that have an effect on the lifespan of the grandchildren? And this is what came out. If the grandfather had a lot to eat between his eighth and twelfth year of life, the so-called slow growth period, then his male grandchildren lived on average, and depending on the model you use to uh, calculate that, between 6 and 32 years less than the grandchildren of grandparents who didn't have so much to eat in this age period. Hmm, interesting. And there's been other human studies that have shown a similar effect. Now I will have to change to animal models, because many of these experiments you can't do with humans. So bear with me the next experiments, but many of the things that are found in animal models you can translate into humans also. So here's, I have to remember to change here, the Aguri Mai mouse. Actually here, both of these little mice are genetically the same. They have the same genes, yeah? But one looks a little bit strange. It looks fat, it's yellow. The thing is, in that mouse, one gene can express more than in this other mouse. Both have the same gene, but here it's turned off because it's methylated, okay? And this one is yellow, fat, develops diabetes, cancer, and so on. So what uh, scientists did was to see if food could have an influence on this. You see, to get these methyl groups to put in there, it depends what you're eating. Broccoli, for example, is a good source of methyl groups, yeah? So what they did was to have two groups of mice. One, both mothers were these yellow agouti expressing females, and one of them got, during the time she was pregnant, a diet that was supplemented with methyl donors. And when the pups were born, it was seen that in the pups of that group, many of them were brown because the gene had been turned off just by what the mother ate during pregnancy. The genes hadn't changed because they were already there by the time, okay? So what you eat has an effect on gene expression. Another uh, study, that was done was with a high-fat diet. Again, normal diet, high-fat diet. And then when the pups were born, they were exposed to a chemical agent that triggers cancer. And as you can see, the pups from the mothers who received a high-fat diet developed more breast tumors than the control diet. I mean, these little mice have never been exposed to anything different than the control group, just because the mother ate more fat during pregnancy. And not only that, that could also be seen on the second generation. Then the effect was lost, but for estrogens, it stays even to the third generation. And maybe the men here are thinking, oh, well, uh, my wife or my future, my girlfriend should uh, watch out what she's eating, what she's doing. I don't have to care. But another study with males showed that a low-protein diet in the male leads to altered methylation patterns in the cholesterol genes and so on. So the daughters of these mice develop more metabolic syndrome. And a very interesting study with worms. I don't like worms, but they're good because they live short. Um, scientists turned off a couple of genes for just a couple of days in generation zero. And that made these worms live 25% longer. Nothing else was changed. 
the genes after a couple of days were expressed again, everything went fine, the worms reproduced and had more worms, and for three generations, the worms of this first group lived 25% longer. Interestingly, on the fourth generation, the effect was erased. And I mean, when I read this paper, I couldn't, I mean, the only thing I could do was think about this Bible verse. I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. God knew it, God knew it all along. He knew when he gave the commandments, what you do has an impact, not just because you're nice or bad to your children. It actually changes things in the composition of your children. And that effect can last, and it takes time sometimes for it to go away. You have a longer shadow than you may think. And it's nice, like it was said yesterday, that so many young people are here. Think about it. Your decisions have a long-lasting impact. And it's not only food. It's been shown on the rats. There's two kinds of rats. One of them take care of their pups. They lick them and they groom them and they take time. And the other ones don't like their pups so much. Yeah? And it's been shown that when you, uh, you have to kill these little pups and analyze the expression and if this glucocorticoid receptor gene is turned on and off, the pups of the leaking rats had a lot of expression of this glucocorticoid receptor, which is key to stress responses, to modulating stress responses. The pups of the other rats had the low expression of this gene because it was highly methylated. So just leaking and taking care of the pups can turn on a gene on or off. So hug the people you love, express your love. It changes people. And it wasn't only this gene, it was 900 genes whose expression was changed. Let's go on. You might think, okay, I'm already born. So what happens in infancy? A study with 40 men in their 40s, they asked them how was the environment when they grew up? Did they have a lot of money, not so much money? And then they isolated uh, material from these men and looked if the genes were turned on and or off. And they could clearly see, I mean, you don't have to understand what's going on here, but you see a group of green and red genes, on and off. And they could separate, I mean, the investigators didn't have any idea if these men had had a lot of money or were poor in their infancy. Looking at the genes, they could predict quite well if that had been the case. So what happens in your infancy leaves marks on you. But you say, okay, I'm a pretty adult. I can't change how my infancy was. You can still do something. For example, the type of diet. We are exposed to a high fat sucrose diet nowadays. But it, you see, the expression of the uh, triglyceride concentration can be lowered if you eat a high fat sucrose supplemented with methylation agents diet. So, and this is because you turn off <coughs> genes that are involved in this whole metabolism thing. And I know lifestyle decisions are not so easy. I hated tomatoes when I was small. I didn't like them. My parents kept pushing and finally I learned to eat tomatoes and vegetables and now I love them. And my daughter, that's a picture of her, she ate tomatoes as if they were apples. Oh, <laughs> something I couldn't do. And I know choosing the right food is not easy. I love these little German orange cakes. But last year when I was preparing a similar presentation and I got into all this information, I realized even if, I mean, you could allow yourself to eat one of these cakes every day, it's not good for you. And I've stopped eating them. I mean, just thinking about what I'm telling you has helped me to overcome my desire for these little cakes. And I think you can too. When I, you understand the mechanisms behind this, you will know my decisions leave memorize um, things in the cells. So, so just think about it. Foods. There is foods that lead to histone or help histones to get modified, histones opening and closing, yeah? And methylation, putting on these marks. 
So, broccoli, eat your broccoli, people, curcumin, soy, and so on. They're good for you. We are born with a set of genes. We can't change them, but we can do something to be better, <laughs> be on the cover for things that we have inherited that are not so good. Yeah? So you can do that too. <laughs> it's not only food, maybe it's a rest. A study with twins has shown that even if they have the same genetic predisposition to getting fat, yeah, like these little kids, if you sleep less than seven hours each day, then this genetic predisposition determines like 70% of your body mass index. If you sleep more than nine hours a day, then that influence goes down to 32%. So, I mean, the same genes. It's just sleeping, what you eat, and so on, allows you to give your genes more power or take power away from your genes. So, next time you're tempted or the doctor says something, your weight problem is partly genetic and partly Boston pie or whatever you like. Last example. Um, it's been shown that if you eat broccoli sprouts, for example, they measure in humans now the activity of this enzyme that takes away the acetylation marks. So it removes them and then the histones pack the DNA tightly again. When you eat broccoli sprouts, you inhibit that. The acetylation marks stay there and your cells can read the genes. And look, it stays for about, let's say, 18 hours. After one day, you should eat broccoli sprouts again if you want this activity to be there again. So it really has an impact. And it also has an impact, for example, on uh, there's rats that uh, develop cancer, yeah? And they gave two groups of rats this sulforaphane-rich diet. So what's in broccoli, it's sulforaphane, yeah? And they gave the rats, and these rats tend to develop tumors by nature because of some mutation they have. And the rats that get, got the broccoli diet, they developed less tumors. So you can really keep your genes at bay depending on what you eat. So predisposition is not predestination. Please keep this in mind. And I hope that you will get an idea and start thinking about what could have gone on with Jacob's goats. And I guess Archimboldo, if someone has been to Vienna, he has seen this picture, was probably right. I mean, he painted this picture like 600 years ago, and another, there's a couple of pictures in, uh, or, yeah, uh, paintings in this collection which are of the same theme. Maybe we are what we eat, yeah? Look at this picture by uh, Chimboldo. Fruit. <laughs> he was very smart 600 years ago. So think about it. What you do influences your health, and not only your health, that of your children and grandchildren. Even if your children are already born, you can give love, you can give uh, tips to them for their grandchildren and so on. So, I mean, the only thing I can do is praise God. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know this very well. Thank you.